Welcome to our 10.30 a.m. service. I'm Dave, the Associate Pastor here at Mountainside. A great way to help support our church community is to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more on YouTube. If you're on Facebook, make sure to like and follow for more. Another great thing to do is to share this video with your family and friends. This morning, we are going to start off with a worship song, announcements, two more worship songs, and then the sermon by Pastor Dawson Lang. Thank you for joining. We really are glad you're here. As a reminder, we do our evening services at 5 p.m. at Discovery Fellowship. Thank you. Let's worship. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great Thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me How great Thou art How great Thou art my soul, my Savior, God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou Hey, good morning and welcome to Mountainside Community Church. And uh, we are in, what, the middle of October now. And uh, thank you for tuning in. Hey, I wanted to thank so many of you. We have received many, many gracious gifts for this ministry. If you're a giver to Mountainside, if this, if, if this is your home church, we thank you for that. We have people giving online. We have people giving in person at our in-person service. That's wonderful. Um, we just thank you and appreciate you for being a faithful giver to the kingdom of God. As always, you can go online and give top right corner. Uh, you can click and give there. 
And like I said, we still have our in-person service and we would love to see you there. We would love to worship uh, with you. And um, I just want us to continue to move forward as a church to the best of our ability. So um, also, we are praying for one another. If you have a need, if you have a prayer request, if you need some help, if there's something going on in your life um, with COVID, sometimes things feel a little bit distanced. We want to help you, the staff here, the elders here at Mountainside. So if you would email myself, Pastor Dave, one of the staff members, an elder, if you would let us know, hey, um, this is a prayer request that we have, we can send that to the prayer team. If you have a need, let us know. We might be able to help you. And so we're always looking uh, for ways to encourage you in your Christian life, to help you, to pray for you, and to uh, live life together even in all of this. Um, as always, you can always go online also, mccreno.org, and you can see what's coming up. Lots of events. We've got men's events, women's events. We've got men's studies, women's studies. Uh, we have things going on. Uh, that we would love to see you uh, to see you at. So great to uh, be with you this morning, and uh, God bless. Then this heart can describe 
my sails filled with your word sail the sea of life My God, He loves me, abounding in love, He shares His glory. Day by day, you still clothe the lilies, be still my heart. Creator is working in me Worry not my soul My God, He loves me These idols all torn down For His glory Or so much more Than this heart can describe my sails filled with your word sail the sea of life alleluia my God he loves me abounding in love he shares his glory Alleluia My God He loves me Abounding in love He shares His glory Day by day You still Clothe the lilies, be still my heart. Creator is working in me. Hey, good morning and welcome to Mount Side Community Church. What you don't know, I'm going to give you a little uh, behind the scenes insight. Today is October 1st and I'm actually preaching for our October 18th uh, sermon. So I'm going to predict the future right now. Um, The reason we're doing this is actually um, Pastor Dave will be on a trip to visit family who is very sick. And so we love him. We are praying for him. We want to encourage him. And uh, I want to do everything that I could to, to get ahead so that he has freedom to do that trip. So it's October 1st. <clears throat> Israel just preached right before me. And what I love is I've been preaching for seven months in this chair, never a water, never a seltzer water. I come in after Israel. Right here, there's water, there's seltzer water. There's all these th- little treats. And I'm like, oh, the illustrious Israel Sandoval was here. Must I mean, it must be nice. I bring in my own little Diet Coke and I I just sit in this chair and Dave just just lashes me and just gets more sermons out of me. So, hey, so Israel just preached here, but that's for this coming Sunday. So two weeks ago, Israel brought us the word, I believe. Last week, Neil Brower was here. I'm predicting the future and now I'm here. So... I want to thank Israel as always. He is a student of the word. We love him. We appreciate him. I want to thank Neil Brower for coming uh, up to Reno. In fact, Neil will be online and in person. Uh, Well, now I'm predicting the past. He was in person. And so you'll find that out on an email. So this morning we are back in the book of Matthew. And Israel brought us the word from Matthew 26 Uh, verses 1 to 35. I'm going to pick up in verse 36 now, and we're going to finish this chapter. Let me say this. we got some big things uh, in the works right now. This is October 1st, remember, but October 18th. um, Dave and I have some things in the works, and uh, you're going to see some changes uh, at Mountainside and some of the things that we're doing. We're excited about that as we finish up this book, 
and we're almost done with the book of Matthew. This has been a great study, super encouraging. I have personally learned a ton. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 36. Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Wow. Uh, powerful words from Jesus here. This will be an, a very interesting um, section to study this morning. So remember in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, uh, Jesus was preaching on the Mount of Olives. It's called the Olivet Discourse. Now they're in a place um, called Gethsemane, which means an oil press. And so Gethsemane was just outside of the boundaries of the city. Uh, during Passover, during this time, remember there, there would have been a lot of pilgrims into Jerusalem. Getting a spot to stay inside the city would have been nearly impossible. So most of those pilgrims would be staying, kind of camping in tents outside of the city. And Jesus is camping uh, here in Gethsemane probably during this whole week with his disciples. Um, and that actually makes sense because this is going to be in the middle of the night and Judas in the middle of the night is just going to find Jesus somewhere. Well, it makes sense that Judas would have known where Jesus was. He would have known their campsite. And what's fascinating to me is if Jesus wanted to hide from his betrayer in the night, he could have. He could have just said, you know, we're going to camp somewhere else tonight. We're going to go in, over here. We're going to go to a different city. Instead, Jesus knows exactly where, where, where Judas is going to be because Judas knows where he camps and Jesus is going to go to his campsite and he's going to wait. So this is a really uh, beautiful passage as we look at the humanity of Jesus here. And uh, this, this prayer, what I see is I see three things happening here. I really see Jesus wrestling with it with, in three ways. Number one, he's wrestling with his own feelings. Number two, he's wrestling with God the Father. And number three, he's wrestling um, with his disciples. Let's review that. Number one, Jesus is sorrowful and troubled as he wrestles with his feelings. That word sorrow here means to be grieved or sad to the point of distress. If you think about it, Jesus is about to face something that is absolutely horrific. We're not just talking about his death uh, by crucifixion. We're not just talking about a physical pain. We're also talking about spiritual pain. If you think about it this way, um, on the cross, when the father turns his back on, on the son, he separates from the son. This will be the first time in his entire life that Jesus is shut off from the father. And that would have been a, a, a horribly, a, a, a very horrific thing for Jesus to go through. And I wanted to free you up. I think it's great that Jesus in his prayer is just honest about how he feels to the Father. Listen, God the Father knows how you feel anyways. You might as well be honest. And rather than just saying, oh, I'm fine, whatever, not thinking about your feelings, not, not, not feeling how life is treating you, it would be great to say, you know what? God here admits that he is hurting. If God admitted that he was hurting and that he didn't want to face something, I can probably be free to be honest with the Father as well and, it, and, and uh, battle with my own feelings as well. That's number one. Number two, Jesus is praying to the Father as he wrestles with the Father. In other words, he's saying to the Father, listen, I don't want to drink this cup. The cup is the wrath of God. So the wrath of God is poured out on sin. He has to do that. 
Jesus is about to take the sins of the world upon him. The cup of wrath that he drinks will be the wrath. All of the wrath that God has against sin will be laid on Jesus so that all of the love that Jesus deserves can be laid on you and me. He knows what he needs to do. He knows he needs to face this, but he also knows this is going to be um, extremely um, hard. And so he uh, prays this prayer, and I think this prayer is a good model for us in the sense that Jesus says, listen, I, I think I know what I'm, I'm going to face here, and I don't want to. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Let me say this. If you never hear anything else that I have to say today or any other sermon and you're tuning in this morning, uh, let me encourage you to hear me now. Um, we need to be about the will of the Father. Listen, you're going to face hard times, tough times. You're going to be tired, depressed, upset, angry, bitter. You're going to go through COVID. You're going to go through highs and lows. You're going to go through money and not money. <clears throat> and in all of that, at the end of the day, I need you to hear me say this. At the end of the day, you need to be about the Father's will. You need to say, hey, no matter what I'm facing, if I'm facing something bad, I'm still going to be about the will of the Father. I've had times like that in my life where I didn't know up from down. I didn't know who my friends or enemies were. People stab me in the back. People lie about me. People spread lies about me. It's easy to get angry and bitter. But in those moments, I told myself, listen, Dawson, you've got to make the next best step. Be about the will of the Father. Do what God wants you to do. And don't worry about what other people are saying. If you think, to, uh, th think about it this way, Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, they basically said, not the Father's will, but our will be done. And now in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, not my will, but the Father's will be done. Boy, that is a powerful image of, of the first Adam and the second Adam. The Adam who failed and we would have failed with him and the Christ who doesn't fail and saves us all. And number three, Jesus is asking for friendship as he really wrestles with the disciples. He keeps asking them, stay up, pray, help me. It's fascinating that Jesus is asking for friendship here. He's asking for support, for backup, for prayer. He's asking that people understand what he's going through. And that's incredible that God needed some friends. Uh, in his hour of greatest need, Jesus wanted those with a sympathetic understanding and a prayerful heart for him. Boy, that's incredible. I've got Christians all the time running around. They got no Christian friends. They're not in church. They have no Christian support. They have no Christian friends. They're not meeting with Christians. If the God of the universe needed Christians around him to support him, to love him, to encourage him, Boy, certainly I need that too. I think we really need to do a much better job of putting ourselves around Christians where we can live out the one another's that scripture has for us, that we don't live the Christian life alone. We live life with other believers. We also live life with those who need Jesus, but they're not a support and encouragement to us in the same way that a Christian can be. And boy, verse 45 is interesting thing, uh, interesting here that Jesus is being handed into the hands of sinners. Wow. His whole life, he's been in the hands of who? The Father. And now the symbolism of Jesus being handed over and he's going to be treated uh, unjustly, wrongly, abusively from the hands of men. At the same time, now, but it's not chaotic. He's not outside of the Father's will. At the same time that these men are going to be held accountable for their sins against Jesus, they are still, Jesus is still inside of the Father's will. Not my will, but yours be done. And boy, if there's nothing you hear from me, please, I'm begging you, hear this. Take stock in your life. Figure out where you are. And this morning say, where am I not doing the Father's will? Man, what, what am I doing wrong? Where, where is the Father's will clear? And I'm saying, nope, my image, my stuff, my hobbies, my things are more important than God's will. They're not. We've got to get that straight. 
Turn with me now. We start in verse 47. Matthew 26, 47. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Wow heartbreaking uh, section of scripture here. Jesus is betrayed with a kiss, a symbol of love and friendship, and he's stabbed in the back. And I'll tell you this, if you've ever been stabbed in the back um, by a Christian or non-Christian, it it hurts. But I got to tell you, Jesus understands how that feels, and uh, you can take that to him. It's interesting that when Judas stabs in the back, other also interesting, nobody ever names their kid Judas or Hitler, for that matter, but certainly Judas. If you're a new family, you think about having kids, mark Judas off. Don't name your boy Judas. It's interesting that Judas betrays Jesus like this. And uh, and look at what Jesus says. Friend, do what you came to do. That word there, um, it's, um, it's almost a neutral. It's not overly positive, but it's not overly negative either. Jesus has spent three and a half years of ministry pouring into Judas, loving Judas, and boy, uh, to be hurt like that, uh, it's bad. Let me also say, we learn from Judas that you can be a follower of Jesus and not be a follower of Jesus. Judas was a physical follower of Jesus in the sense he physically walked around Israel with Jesus, but he was never a heart follower of Jesus. Boy, this is one thing that keeps me up at night. I fear um, that there will be many people when Christ comes again or when they die and they face judgment that that will believe that they follow Jesus and Jesus says, "I, I never knew you. In the book of John, we find out that the disciple who cut off the ear was none other than Peter. You got to love Peter. Big highs, big lows, but at least he's got passion. And so Jesus rebukes him. He rebukes him. I want to I say this. He says in verse, what is that, 52, <clears throat> put your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. I've had that used uh, for an argument for pacifism. Uh, That is not what Jesus is saying there. Jesus is saying there's a time and a place, and right now is not the time nor the place to be striking out. Why? Because there's a bigger fulfillment here. Jesus needs to go to the cross. Jesus needs to die so that millions and millions and millions of people can live. And so uh, that shouldn't be used for um, for that argument. There is a time and a place to protect yourself and to protect others. Jesus' point is, that's not the time. In fact, Jesus says, listen, I could just call 12 legions. A legion was 6,000. So a mere 72,000 angels could come and wipe everybody out, I'm assuming. And he says, but but that's not, again, that's not the will of my Father. Rather than Jesus protecting himself, he protects you and me. Rather than Jesus running from danger, he goes into danger. Uh, It's this beautiful passage where he is willingly giving up his life uh, long before Jesus is actually crucified. He makes choices for you. 
He makes choices to go into harm's way because he knows he must die for the sins of the world. He must drink the cup of the wrath of God. Wow. And then all of that and the disciples run away. You know, just recently they had said, no, we won't run. We'll be there for you. We'll fight for you. And now all of his friends disappear. Verse 57. Matthew 26, 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him and slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? So Jesus will actually face six trials over this this night. Three of those um, will be religious. Those will be before Annas. Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. And then another three of those will be civil trials as he sits before Pilate, Herod, and Pilate. What is he being tried for? Really nothing. The gospel of Matthew makes sure and tells us that these are false witnesses. Someone finally says, you know, he said he could tear down the temple, which would have been a capital offense. But if you know what Jesus was talking about, he wasn't talking about the actual temple. He was speaking metaphorically about his own body, the temple. And he says, I will raise again after the third day. But he says, I am the Messiah. They accuse him of blasphemy, which he's saying, I am God. I will come down. I will judge you. I will be in power. I am God. And they crucify him for that. Don't let anybody tell you any differently. The truth is Jesus was murdered by men because he claimed to be co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father. And now with that admission, they can kill him. Um, And then the violence starts. They begin hitting him, slapping him. They're going to murder him. And he does all of that. He faces all of that because he loves you. He knows he's got to forgive the sins of the world. And the only way to do that is a substitutionary atonement. He will stand in your place and my place. Verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean, but he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the sayings of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I mean, can you imagine your lowest? Let's assume this is Peter's lowest moment in his life. Okay. Can you imagine your lowest moment being recorded in scripture and everybody reading about it for the next 2000 or more years? Wow. I love the Bible because the Bible is real. The Bible takes its key characters and shows you their high points 
and their low points. I got to tell you that Peter here uh, invokes a curse, says, I don't know him. You know, when, when I think about things like that, I think, well, didn't Jesus say, if you deny me before men, I will deny you? He did say that. And here Peter denies him. And we know that Peter's not going to be denied by Jesus later. You know, there's a lot of this that's grace filled. It's relational. Um, I love that Jesus um, challenges us not to deny him. And yet Peter denies him. He repents of his sin and he's going to be restored later. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. But Peter has a past. He denies Jesus. He has this low moment. And soon this moment will be in his past. You have a past and I have a past. We have all sinned against God. Can, can we just make a, an agreement right now? We need to repent of that sin. And then can we keep the past in the past? Can we just walk away from it? Listen, if there's something in your past that was wrong, that was evil, you need to repent. You might need to make it right. You might need to go to someone. You might need to pay something. You might need to make it right in some way. But then the Bible tells us that that sin is separated from you as far as the East is from the West. Let's keep the past in the past. It doesn't do any good to reach to the, to the past and drudge this stuff up and beat yourself over it. If you've repented, move on. If you haven't repented, the Holy Spirit might be prompting, prompting you to repent. But boy, be encouraged that Peter here just does the unthinkable. And yet we're going to find out Jesus absolutely loves him. And Jesus absolutely loves you. Can I encourage all of us this morning with, with all of this? We want to be about the Father's will, but we also know we're going to mess up. We're going to sin. And we will repent of that sin, and then we move forward. The past won't help you. If you've repented, all Satan will do is use your past against you. You have today and you have a future with God the Father because of Jesus Christ. Let's be more positive about that. And let's really lean into the fact that you are absolutely loved by God and you will be used by God. Peter, Peter runs the early church. He's going to be the most important figure besides Paul moving forward. And this is Peter in his low point. Learn your lessons, repent of your sin, and know that even in your low point, Jesus loves you and he died for you. Hey, we always say we love you here at Mountainside Community Church, but most importantly, God loves you. And when we say God loves you, what we mean is God loves you because your Savior, Jesus Christ, took your place and died for all of your sins. The love that Jesus deserved to get, now you receive. What a great message. Have a great week.